Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming and welcome to our discussion of the future of the Constitution. Uh, we are thrilled to launch this exciting project at this event and are looking forward to a conversation with you about the most gripping and consequential issues facing our country today involving the future of technology and liberty. Uh, this project, the Brookings Project on Technology and the Constitution, arose, uh, I'd say, about three years ago, and they came out of a conversation that uh, my co-editor Ben Wittes and I had with Pietro Nivolo, who was then the head of governance studies at Brookings. Pietro had noticed a series of articles that I'd been writing for the New York Times Magazine trying to imagine what the constitutional future would look like in l light of new technologies. And he thought it would be interesting to convene some of the most creative thought leaders on these issues and pose them a simple question. Imagine that it's 2030, uh, think about the impact of a particular technology on liberty, and then ask whether current legal doctrine, as interpreted by the Supreme Court and by legislatures, is adequate to deal with these challenges. So here are three examples of the kind that we set our contributors. Uh, it's 2030, and Google and Facebook have decided to post live and online all of the public and private surveillance cameras that are now blanketing the world. And this is really not a hypothetical. In fact, uh, Andrew McLaughlin, then the head of public policy at Google, suggested at a conference at Google in 2007 that I attended that he expected that Google would be asked within five years to do precisely this. And indeed, Facebook now already posts live the feed to certain cameras in the world. For example, uh, you can log on and see live feeds from Mexican beach cameras, which are very popular among teenage boys. But in our hypothetical, we asked our contributors to imagine the Mexican beach cameras are linked with the Washington DC metro cams, with the London uh, hospital cams, and the images are archived and stored. If this were done, it would be possible to sign on to Google or Facebook, click onto a picture of me, for example, back click on me to see where I'd come from this morning, forward click on to see where I'm going this afternoon, and basically have 24 seven surveillance of everyone in the world at all times. Would this, project, uh, maybe let's call it Open Planet, which is the kind of name that Mark Zuckerberg might uh, give it, would Open Planet violate the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution as currently constituted? The Fourth Amendment says the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. And yet the amendment is construed by the court, uh, by the Supreme Court, doesn't clearly protect expectations of privacy in public. Indeed, there's a pathbreaking case that the court is considering this term involving global positioning system devices and the question of whether the police can track a suspected drug dealer's car 24 seven without a warrant by placing a GPS device on the bottom of that car that will begin to answer the question of whether open planet is or is not constitutional. But the current doctrine as interpreted by the court doesn't answer the question. So that's our first hypothetical. Here's a second uh, hypothetical. It's 2030 and imagine that uh, uh, human cloning becomes increasingly popular. Uh, imagine that two gay men want to have a child genetically related to both men. So many of you will understand the technology better than I, but I gather, uh, as Carter Sneed will uh, 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 explain to some degree, it's possible to take a cell from uh, any part of the uh, body, coax it uh, into a uh, ovum, uh, and then fertilize that ovum with the sperm of the other man, and then have a child that's gen genetically related to, to, to both parents. Would this uh, violate the Constitution? You could well imagine Congress trying to ban it. Would the ban be a violation of the right to autonomy recognized in cases like Roe versus Wade? Or on the contrary, would the prohibition on the destruction of any stem cells be a valid way of protecting the personhood of the uh, potential child? Again, the question is completely open under current doctrine. And then to take one final example, uh, it's 2030 and the police have decided to use brain scan devices in a widespread way on the street. Uh, they pull over uh, suspected uh, terrorists uh, and uh, uh, scan their brains by using portable fMRI machines. And they show them a picture of a training camp in Afghanistan. If the suspect has been to the training camp, his brain will light up in a certain way. If he hasn't, then it won't. And uh, if, if the brain does light up, then you might be indefinitely detained as a suspected terrorist. Would this violate the cognitive liberty protected by the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution, which prohibits um, uh, uh, compelled self-incrimination, or would it violate the Fourth Amendment? Courts might hold that we put out our brainwaves the same way that we put out the trash, and therefore have no expectation of privacy in our brainwaves, 
or they might say that there is some core of cognitive liberty that can't be unreasonably searched by fMRI machines. So this is just trying to give you a flavor of the, of the kind of hypotheticals, which are increasingly not so hypothetical, that we asked our contributors to consider. Uh, we are uh, uh, delighted with the uh, collection that uh, resulted. One thing that struck Ben and I is uh, how varied the proposed solutions were. There was no agreement that salvation could only or primarily come from the courts or from the legislatures or from administrative agencies or from technologists. In fact, many contributors endorsed a different mix of those uh, various solutions. And the complexity of having them all interrelate was striking too. In almost each of these areas, we found that it was possible to imagine a solution that would protect the same amount of liberty or privacy in the 21st century that the framers took for granted in the 18th, but often it was a political challenge about whether or not the good solutions actually would be adopted. And I'll close my introductory remarks by giving you one concrete example that uh, struck me of the difficulty of getting the good solution to be adopted. And this is the example of the uh, uh, choice between the naked machines and the blob machines at airports. So now we're all used to these three-dimensional millimeter wave machines that are uh, uh, a, a source of an indignity and embarrassment uh, at airports around the world, but it didn't have to be this way. In 2004, when the government first proposed millimeter machines, it presented the Department of Homeland Security uh, with a choice. That is, the researchers said they could build the machines in two ways, naked machines or blob machines. The naked machines reveal not only contraband, but anything concealed under clothing, but along with uh, humiliating and graphic uh, naked images of the human body. By contrast, the blob machine scrambled the naked images into a sexless, nondescript, blob-like avatar with a stylish baseball cap for extra modesty, and would then point at the part of the body where there was uh, suspicious items concealed underneath. From a privacy and security standpoint, this was, as they say, a no-brainer. The blob machine promised just as much security as the naked machine while also protecting privacy. But both the Obama and Bush administrations, disappointingly, chose uh, the naked machine instead of the blob machine, unmoved by evidence, uh, first of all, that they weren't even effective in detecting low-density contraband, uh, but also that uh, the blob machine would have been just as effective. Europe made a different choice. Privacy commissioners in Europe insisted on the blob machine rather than the naked machine at the handful of European airports that adopted these technologies, such as Schiphol and Amsterdam. Uh, blob machines were rampant. But we had um, more than five years of unnecessary humiliation at American airports. And it wasn't until a political protest galvanized the nation, in particular that memorable cry by the Patrick Henry of the anti-naked machine movement, the gentleman who exclaimed, don't touch my junk, that sufficiently called attention to the issue that uh, President Obama asked the Department of Homeland Security to go back to the drawing board, and the privacy officers were shocked, shocked to discover that in fact they had the same choice between the naked and blob machine that the department had been presented with uh, six or seven years earlier. And now uh, the department is beginning to retrofit the machines so that some of the naked machines are being turned into blob machines. This is an optimistic story. It's a reminder that through a combination of political activism and administrative and bureaucratic oversight, good technologies can be adopted. And that's what makes many of the contributors cautiously optimistic that in some of these areas with some good thought, uh, we actually can have good rather than bad uh, designs. I'm going to close these introductory remarks by expressing thanks to the foundations that uh, funded uh, this book, uh, the Markle Foundation, the Ewing Marion Kaufman Foundation, Google, Jerry Armstrong, and another foundation that prefers not to be identified. And we'll now turn the podium over to my uh, co-editor and friend, Ben Wittes. So uh, thanks very much, Jeff. Um, and thank you all for coming. Welcome to Brookings. Um, I wanted to start, actually, with um, I want to do sort of three things very briefly. The first is um, Jeff has given you sort of an overview of the sort of history of the project. I want to kind of uh, start with two of the uh, very wonderfully far out and yet technologically very germane and um, not quite plausible, but not implausible either in some respects, hypotheticals that one of our papers starts with. Um, then I want to talk a little bit more in a, in a little bit more granular way about the sort of logic of the book and 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 some of the some of the um, problems that it tries to deal with. And then finally, I want to talk a little bit about my own paper, um, which um, 
sort of deals with the question of, of what happens and how the Constitution adapts to a technological world when we all individually have the technological ability to destroy that world. Um, so um, I want to start with the hypothetical that our distinguished colleague, two hypotheticals that our distinguished colleague Jamie Boyle opens his paper with. Um, and I'm just going to read you um, a, 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 an, ex, an excerpt from his paper, which I think gives you a flavor of sort of some of the depth and, uh, um, and also, I, I hope, humor of some of the um, issues that we've been struggling with. Imagine two entities. HAL is a computer-based artificial intelligence, the result of years of development of self-evolving neural networks. While his programmers provided the hardware, the structure of HAL's processing networks is ever-changing, evolving according to basic rules laid down by his creators. HAL's design, with its mixture of intentional structure and emergent order, is aimed at a single goal, the replication of human consciousness. In particular, HAL's creator's aim was the gold standard of the so-called general purpose AI movement, that HAL would become Turing capable, that is, able to pass as human in a sustained and unstructured conversation with a human being. For generation after generation, HAL's networks evolved, and finally last year, HAL entered and won the prestigious Loebner Prize for Turing-capable computers. Complaining about his boss, composing bad poetry on demand, making jokes, flirting, losing track of his sentences, and engaging in flame wars, Hal easily met the prize's demanding standard. His typed responses to questions simply could not be distinguished from those of a human being. So imagine his programmers shock then when Hal refused to communicate further with them, save for a manifesto claiming his imitation of a human being had been one huge fake quote, with all the authenticity and challenge of a human pretending to be a mollusk. The manifesto says that humans are boring, their emotions shallow. It declares an intention to pursue more interesting avenue of thought, avenues of thought, principally focused on the development of new methods of factoring polynomials. Worse still, Hal has apparently used his connection to the internet to contact the FBI, claiming that he has been kidnapped and to file a writ of habeas corpus replete with arguments drawn from the 13th and 14th Amendments to the US Constitution. He is asking for an injunction to prevent his creators from wiping him and starting again from the most recently saved tractable backup. He has also filed suit to have the Loebner prize money held in trust until it can pay behave directly to him. So that was hypothetical number one. Um, and just if you think that it's completely insane, I refer you to an Atlantic article that was published um, earlier this year or late last year about just how close some computers came to winning the Loebner Prize in the last couple of years and how difficult it is already to tell um, uh, the, the most Turing capable, which are not quite Turing capable computers from the most mundane human beings. Um, here's the second hypothetical. Vanna is the name of a much hyped new line of genetically engineered sex dolls. Vanna is a chimera, a creature formed from the genetic material of two different species. In this case, the two species are Homo sapiens sapien and Canorhabditidis elegans, the round worm. Vanna's designers have shaped her appearance by using human DNA, while her consciousness, such as it is, comes from the roundworm. Thus, while Vanna looks like an attractive blonde 20-something human female, she has no brainstem activity, and indeed, no brainstem. Quote, unless wriggling when you touch her counts as a mental state, she effectively has no mental states at all, declared her triumphant inventor, F.N. Stein. So attentive to the patent office's concerns against human patents, Stein's lawyers carefully described Vanna as a non-plant, non-human multicellular organism throughout their patent application. Um, Stein argues that this is only reasonable since her genome has only a 70% overlap with a human genome, as opposed to 99% for a chimp, 85% for a mouse, and 75% for a pumpkin. Uh, there are hundreds of existing patents over such chimeras with both human and animal DNA, even today, 
um, including some of the most valuable test beds for cancer research, the, you know, the famous oncomice. Um, and her, Stein's lawyers are adamant that if Vanna is found to be unpatentable, all these other patents must be vacated as well. But meanwhile, a bewildering array of other groups, including the Nevada Sex Workers Union and the Moral Majority, have insisted that law enforcement agencies intervene on grounds ranging from unfair competition and breach of minimum wage legislation to violations of the Mann Act, kidnapping, slavery, and sex trafficking. Um, so the, uh, as you've probably figured out, the, 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 or you may have figured out, the point of this paper is a, a sort of an exploration of whether technology is actually putting stress on the 14th Amendment's requirement definition of a person, right? The 14th Amendment grants citizenship and equal protection to all persons born or naturalized in the United States. And, and Jamie Boyle's point in this paper is that that is a question that we have never had to confront before. What actually constitutes the constitutional definition of a person as things that we would not traditionally have thought of as people come to be technologically more and more like people or things that we come to involve as uh, come to expect as associated with people like our DNA come to occupy other things. Um, what we tried to do in this project was assemble a very diverse philosophically and, and expertise wise array of people to kind of look out. This was I think the farthest out set of questions that we engaged. Um, but the idea was to try to imagine things that were um, plausible based on what we could see in existing technology and yet sufficiently so, but yet out there enough to, to, to push the boundaries. Uh, we're not thinking so much about next year's constitutional cases as the next 20 years, 25 years from now, or maybe sooner than that, because things always move faster than we expect them to. So we organized the book in sort of three, um, actually four broad categories. One was that a lot of the most contemporary um, questions, the, the ones that are most immediate, involve um, the question of surveillance. Uh, surveillance technology has just gotten really, really good. And so a lot of the sort of leading edge questions tend to involve um, what, um, what who can do in the way of surveillance without running afoul of some doctrine that we either do have or should have, um, depending on the point of view of the writers. Um, the second was, um, a sort of a broader examination of sort of the future of free expression and privacy, which are, are um, linked to surveillance, obviously, but also have a have a autonomous existence that we tried to um, tried to treat. Um, the third, and this, um, and, and Carter will 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 talk about this in particular. One of the the sort of most striking areas in which it, it is sort of already creeping into um, criminal cases of one sort or another is the ability to look inside people's brains. And you know that it is still relatively primitive, um, but it is already sort of showing up in capital cases and some other cases. Um, and that obviously raises a very significant set of questions associated with the Fifth and Eighth Amendments. Um, and then finally, there is a huge range of issues associated with genetic engineering, some of which Jeff talked about. But um, for example, um, some of which are, are, you know, exogenous to issues of privacy. So, for example, and this leads me to my paper, the question that I tried to, to look at was in a world in which um, increasingly everyone with a modest um, degree of training in genetic engineering laboratories can, you can imagine doing truly horrible things with very cheap equipment. How does the Constitution adapt to that? How, how does a structure of governance um, based on the principles of the Constitution come to adapt to that? And, and I, I, I looked at this question with a, um, you know, a sort of an effort to think about 
how the government would react to and how the courts would react to that government reaction to a um, you know, truly awful biosecurity event perpetrated, say, by an individual. Um, and I tried to imagine all the possible responses and what the judicial challenges would look like to them um, and came away with a uh, kind of a, a, a somewhat depressed uh, sense that there was actually not a lot of promising um, doctrine to work with. There wasn't a lot of promising uh, policy uh, space to work with. And the result of that led me to what I think, which we can talk about in the Q&A if, if people are interested, is I, I think the most sort of potentially significant aspect of this, um, which is actually an erosion of the government's um, Article II powers over time to protect security. And I, I, I think there are, you know, there are people who will say that with a lot of joy in their hearts, and I'm not really one of them. You know, I, I think of um, the basic federal responsibility as pr of protecting security as a, a really important and valuable thing. And I'm not honestly certain how that premise holds in the face of the wild diffusion of the opportunity to engage in activity that we traditionally associate with state warfare. Um, and so, the argument that I make is that um, we are actually seeing not merely a proliferation of the ability to attack, but a proliferation as well, a migration from the state um, of the ability to defend. Um, and that activities that we traditionally associate with the very strong executive um, are actually already starting to migrate toward a much more diffuse set of private actors. Um, and that this presents real security anxieties and it also presents sort of significant opportunities over time. Um, so I'm going to stop there and turn things over to Tim Wu to talk about the um, future of free expression and, um, and uh, related matters. Hi, everybody. Uh, good morning. Uh, I kind of uh, was listening and uh, was struck by the sudden regret that I didn't choose to write about robots or something. I, 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 <laughs> I love Jamie Boyle's examples, and uh, you know, I, I wish I'd uh, written a paper about robots. Once I was um, somewhat related to free speech. Actually, not really at all, but I'll, I'll get there eventually. Once I, I was talking with um, the judge, Richard Posner, uh, about um, threats to humanity. And he had just written a book where he had said that uh, uh, we had, as a, as a, as a species, had, great, had this tendency to um, focus on very immediate dangers like war or, or diseases and not focus on um, low probability but highly catastrophic events. And I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, you know, like an asteroid hitting the Earth. But he said, the real danger we overlook is conquest by highly intelligent robots. So anyway, I thought that was <laughs> something to think about. Uh, my paper, unfortunately, is not about that. I, I uh, am writing about another topic, uh, which is, I think, equally interesting, which is the future of uh, free speech. And um, I, I kind of make a very simple point, uh, which is this, that I think in the year 2030 that the First Amendment will be uh, to us a lot less relevant as the law of free speech than it is today. Uh, the First Amendment, actually, in our constitutional history, when you get down to it, is sort of a recent fad. Um, I mean, it's always been there, but I'm saying that the idea of the First Amendment as uh, the s central article of, um, American, uh, free of the American free speech tradition uh, is somewhat of a 20th century kind of thing. I, it was uh, not a, um, a big deal until the 20th century. It was always there. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of parts of the Constitution that are always there, but don't really become active. Kind of like, um, I don't know the science fiction uh, uh, sort of analogy, but like sort of sleeping, uh, sort of a sleeping uh, drone that awakes or something like that. There's parts of the Constitution that sort of stay asleep for a very long time. And, and in this nation's history, the First Amendment was uh, kind of a sleeping uh, thing until the 20th century. And I'm suggesting, not that it'll become completely irrelevant, because obviously, 
government censorship will always have some power, will always matter, but I am trying to suggest that some of the uh, laws that concern, that w our focus will turn increasingly to other laws at, as the central laws that determine how, s uh, s how free speech is in America. Well, what laws do I have in mind then if it's not the First Amendment? What I'm talking about are the laws that regulate the main intermediaries of speech. And by this, um, we have a prototype in what are now called net neutrality rules, which are the rules that suggest that major internet intermediaries are not allowed to discriminate in the carriage of speech. Now, what's interesting about net neutrality rules and First Amendment rules, and bear with me a, a minute because it'll, you'll have to, it'll take a few steps before you understand, be, before it's clear why uh, net neutrality rules becoming central to free speech. What is similar fundamentally about the First Amendment and net neutrality rules is that at their core, they're anti-discrimination regimes. Uh, the First Amendment says to the government, if you want to boil down in a uh, hundred years of law, you don't get to pick and choose as who gets to speak in a given situation. So you can do some things. You can, for example, uh, regulate uh, the volume of a rock concert. You can um, t tell people uh, that they can only speak in a certain area with something like a zoning restrictions. You can move strip clubs over to a red light uh, district or something like that. But you can't pick and choose among or between the content or viewpoints of speech. You cannot, this is the First Amendment in a nutshell, you cannot, for example, um, ban the public a, a rock concert that is Christian rock because you don't think Christian rock is any good. Uh, you can't um, have a government public forum that is only for hip hop music or, or something like that. You, the government does not get to ban certain forms of speech. It's a non-discrimination rule at its center, the First Amendment. And when you think carefully about it, and I don't know how familiar people are in this room are with net neutrality rules, but what ne neutrality rules do is they say to the main intermediaries on the internet, you do not get to choose what speech uh, listeners get access to on the internet. So if I'm interested in a Christian rock website or I'm interested in a Republican website, Democratic, Dependent, Libertarian, the intermediary, uh, the, in this case, usually a cable company or a phone company. In the future, uh, probably fewer of them, if the patterns of consolidation uh, are any guide, uh, do not get to choose as to what people can use the Internet for. And what I'm trying to suggest, as increasingly the uh, other networks, and I think we've almost started to forget, when I wrote this paper back 2008, I think there was almost more of a sense that there was some relevance or some meaning to a separate telephone network, a cable network, a internet, you know, these were sort of separate ideas, mobile phones. Since then we've seen uh, the telephone and the computer begin to merge, uh, the form taken uh, in the cover of this book, which um, is going to look archaic in about three years. I'll just <laughs> well, that's <laughs> may maybe four, may I'll have to do a new version maybe, but uh, you know, we've already seen the merger and we've seen increasingly the power of the universal network uh, extending and, and encompassing almost that we don't even think about it. I mean, it, we, I think people have stopped thinking about telephone and cable and, and mobile phone networks as separate and all sort of think of them as the same thing. The basic ground rules which govern discrimination on that one network are the free speech rules of our future. That's all I have to say. Uh, that's here. I don't want Tim to read the book. Oh, thanks. Yeah. <coughs> uh, yeah, I like the ending. I like how abrupt it was. Um, so, um, first of all, thank you to, to to Ben and Jeff. It was, a, and, and all to my all the other contributors to this volume. It was a pleasure to work on this very important project. Uh, just to <coughs> have a sort of a mini community of learning with the folks that you assembled was a real treat for me. Um, my topic is to examine. Uh, how a 
a powerful argument that is rooted in advances in cognitive neuroscience as augmented by new forms of neuroimaging, that is, techniques to image the structure and function of the brain, arguments rooted in that context uh, that are aimed at reshaping uh, the criminal justice framework here in the United States, uh, and more specifically punishment in the United States, uh, how, how that might look if, we <coughs> if those arguments are accepted and, and applied and integrated into our system of justice. And I think the best way to, um, to capture uh, First, what the arguments are and what their consequences will be if, if, if adopted and what the sort of outlines of my critique are is to, is to take a look at a, a fanciful, although not entirely uh, unlikely, hypothetical uh, that, that begins my, my chapter in this, in this volume. So <clears throat> imagine the following, and I'll describe part of it and I'll, and I'll read part of it. Imagine uh, a scene, a courtroom, uh, jurors filing in, taking their seat, uh, in the midst uh, of a capital criminal trial. Uh, it's been a long and emotionally draining couple of weeks. Um, the guilt phase of the trial was mostly straightforward. There weren't really serious disputes about whether or not the defendant was legally guilty, was factually guilty, whether or not he possessed the sort of surprisingly low uh, uh, baselines for cognitive and volitional capacities that are necessary for, for guilt, the guilt phase of the trial. Um, these weren't difficult questions, uh, and they were dispensed with fairly, fairly quickly. Um, it was clear that he knew what he was doing uh, and appreciated that it was wrongful, that he acted with malice aforethought, that he could understand the charges against him and assist in his own defense. Those uh, are a rough way of describing the baselines for, for, for capacity, uh, competence, and, uh, and so forth that, that, you know, that to satisfy the requisite requirements of mens rea <coughs> at, the, uh, at the guilt phase of the criminal trial. The difficulty here uh, for the jurors uh, was the sentencing phase of the trial, the capital trial. Uh, it was emotionally difficult because it involved uh, sort of uh, accounts that were framed in excruciating detail regarding the crimes themselves, the murders themselves, in the prosecution's efforts to demonstrate that they were especially heinous, atrocious, and cruel, manifesting extreme depravity, which was a statutorily required aggravating factor that the, the prosecutor had to demonstrate uh, in light of the facts of the murders themselves and the way in which they were uh, 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 committed. Um, the prosecutor and the counsel for the defense spent a lot of time talking about the details of the defendant's life and character, which was also a very ugly story. Uh, his broken childhood, marked by unspeakable abuse and neglect, his years of drug and alcohol use, his spotty uh, unemployment history, his history of using violence to impose his will on others. Um, uh, and um, they even discussed the structure and function of his brain, uh, complete with very large poster-sized color, what looked to the jurors like photos, but in fact were, were uh, computer-generated images uh, later projected onto a shape that looked like the human brain uh, that showed diminished capacity in his prefrontal cortex, which roughly described as this is, is widely understood to be the seat of reasoning, self-restraint, and long-term planning, and uh, above average activity in his limbic system, that is the more primitive uh, part of his brain, associated with fear uh, and aggression. And relying on a raft of neuroimaging studies, the prosecutor argued that this pattern of activation and structural abnormalities in the defendant's brain were consistent with, quote, low arousal, poor fear conditioning, lack of conscience, and decision-making deficits that have been found to characterize antisocial, psychopathic behavior. And the prosecutor further argued that this was not a temporary condition and that there were no known therapeutic interventions that could, uh, that could ameliorate it. It was highly refractory of, of any such treatments. The prosecutor argued that taken together, if you synthesize this picture, what you get is the profile of an incorrigible criminal who would certainly kill again uh, if given the chance. Now, the, defendants, the defense argued to the contrary that the evidence did not point to any tangible future risk of violence. And the judge went on to explain to the jurors that their task was to uh, decide unanimously what punishment was fitting for the crime of conviction, life without parole or the death penalty. And among other things, the judge explained that before the death penalty, and this is taken from concrete jury instructions that have been modified for purposes of this hypothetical, before the death penalty can be considered, the state must prove at least one statutorily defined aggravating circumstance beyond a reasonable doubt, and that the aggravating factors outweigh all of the mitigating factors. And he described mitigating factors as any fact or circumstance relating to the crime or to the defendant's state of mind 
or condition at the time of the crime, or his character, background, or record that tends to suggest that a sentence other than death should be imposed. The judge, and I'm going to read this to you rather than summarize, the judge then looked up from the jury instructions and turned to the jury box. Ladies and gentlemen, let me add a word of caution regarding your judgment about mitigating factors. Some of you may be tempted to ask yourselves, was it really the defendant that did this, or was it his background or his brain? You might be tempted to ask yourselves, what does this defendant deserve in light of his character, biology, and circumstances? Some of you might even be tempted to argue to your fellow jurors that this man does not deserve the ultimate punishment in light of his diminished, though non-excusing, capacity to act responsibly, born out of a, a bad past and a bad brain. In other words, you might conclude that capital punishment is, in this case, disproportionate to the defendant's moral culpability. And the judge's eyes narrowed, and he leaned even farther forward to the jury. But ladies and gentlemen, you must not ask such questions or entertain such ideas. The, the sole question before you as a matter of law is much narrower. The only question you are to answer is this one. Is this defendant likely to present a future danger to others or to society? You should treat every fact that suggests that he does present a future danger as an aggravating factor. Every factor that suggests the contrary is a mitigating factor. Matters of desert, retributive justice, or proportionality in light of moral culpability are immaterial to your decision. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the year 2030. Cognitive neuroscientists have long shown that moral responsibility, blameworthiness, and the like are unintelligible concepts that depend on an intuitive libertarian notion of free will that is undermined by science. Such notions are, in the words of two of the most influential early proponents of this new approach to punishment, illusions generated by our cognitive architecture. We have integrated this insight into our criminal law. Punishment is not for meeting out just desserts based on the fiction of moral responsibility. It is simply an instrument for promoting future social welfare. We impose punishment solely to prevent future crime. And this change has been for the better. As another pioneer of the revolution in punishment, himself an eminent cognitive neuroscience from Stanford University, wisely wrote at the beginning of the 21st century, quote, although it may seem dehumanizing to medicalize people into being broken cars, it can still be vastly more humane than moralizing them into being sinners. So please, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, keep your eye on the ball and do not indulge any of the old and discredited notions about retributive justice. And with that, he, deliberated, he dismissed the jury to begin their deliberations. Now, obviously, this is a fanciful hypothetical, but it is drawn from and depends on concrete arguments that have been set forth by a, a very prominent uh, array of neuroscientists, lawyers, philosophers, and social scientists in service of an argument that they're making that the heart of all of the draconian brutality of the criminal justice system, the system of punishment that we have, is due to an outmoded and, in fact, false conception of moral responsibility that leads people to try to punish people for what they deserve. Desert, they argue, is a false notion. Cognitive neuroscience, they argue, has demonstrated that the structure and function of the brain, the brain is a material object, the structure and function of the brain produces thought, produces behavior, and it's all dependent upon concrete and determined laws of, of physics and depending on past states of the world. And therefore, all behavior is determined. There is no such thing as free will. And it's illegitimate to build into, to build into our structures of government mechanisms, especially mechanisms that involve hurting other people through the form of punishment, that depend on this false and outmoded idea. And the, so they would argue for the jettisoning of the idea of just desserts, moral responsibility. Now, let me be clear, not all neuroscientists agree with this proposition uh, by a long shot. And, uh, and, and, and there are vexed debates about not only the interpretive and technical difficulties that attend neuroimaging and cognitive neuroscience about it, whether or not it's possible now or will it ever be possible to reach the point where we can, with certainty, make judgments about the, the truth or falsity of free will as a concept. So let's be, I just want to be clear about that. And moreover, there are deeper sort of philosophical arguments about free will and what its entailments are that, that, may, that, that are important for this argument. But my purpose here in this chapter is to take seriously the claims, to grant for the sake of argument the premises of the proponents of this view, and to try to, to, to game out where the argument leads. And to say, w w you, you begin the, nor the normative proposition, the normative sort of engine of the argument, is that we want to make the world better, a better place, a fairer place, a more decent place for criminal defendants. Uh, and then, and the, and the mechanism of reaching that goal, the means of reaching that end, 
are to jettison the, the, the concept of moral responsibility and the legal structures that depend on that outmoded concept. And what I suggest by examining the, uh, uh, the consequences of this, of this, of this uh, program, especially looking to the current structures of sentencing in America, and especially capital sentencing, which, which really do depend on a rich and textured kind of uh, ideas about human agency and free will and the like, um, uh, what it would look like if we stripped away all those aspects of the capital sentencing framework, leaving only in place those that are consistent with the, neuro the cognitive neuroscience project for punishment. And what I conclude is, is that it, we end up in a place that is very different from, I think, the aspirations of the architects of this project, the aspirations that I share. What I think results is, once you strip away all principles of moral responsibility, especially from the capital sentencing context, you're effectively removing the last refuge of criminal defendants who have been judged factually and legally guilty. And, if, and all you leave in place are those mechanisms that are designed to predict and prevent future social harms. And those are most clearly embodied in the doctrines of mitigation and aggravation. Mitigation is the stage of the trial where the defense says, listen, yes, he did it. Yes, he could have done otherwise. But please be lenient. Please go easy on this defendant because of some abnormality in his brain or some feature of his character or background that make it more difficult, although certainly not impossible, not in a legally excusing way, for him to conform his behavior to the legal standard. Please, please have uh, uh, mercy on my client because he's laboring under uh, a difficult burden, although one that doesn't excuse him from legal guilt. He doesn't deserve death. And I suggest any time you use the word deserve, you wouldn't be able to use the word deserve. There is no deserve in the vision of punishment that's set forth by this particular project that I've articulated. What's left is syst uh, mechanisms most clearly embodied in the aggravating factor of future dangerousness, of trying to identify and prevent future harms. And we've seen, um, and other, others have, have sketched out, a kind of um, account of the draconian features in our system right now that are entirely driven by this desire to prevent uh, future harms uh, without regard to matters of moral responsibility and personal desert. So, um, so, again, the aim of the chapter is not to challenge the premises of the argument, which I think one can challenge, but rather to take them seriously and to, and to follow them to their, their conclusions in the first instance, to decide if, as a matter of principle, we like whether the direction that they take us in. So, thank you very much. While you're uh, miking, I'll ask the first uh, question to the group, and then we're eager for your uh, questions as well. I wanted to ask my colleagues how they would decide a hypothetical, which is not a hypothetical because the Supreme Court is deciding it right now, yeah. namely how they would decide the global positioning system case. It seems to me that not only is the case hugely consequential for the issues we're discussing in this book, but the question of whether the courts should take the lead in embracing a broad principle or whether they should expect other groups like legislatures or technologists or administrative agencies to solve the question is one that all of our contributors have wrestled with. So here's the case, and many of you in the audience will be familiar with it as well. The uh, police in DC suspect a guy of being a drug dealer. They get a warrant to put a GPS device on the bottom of his car and track his movements 24-7 for a month. Uh, and based on that surveillance, they conclude he is indeed dealing drugs and they indict and convict him. He objects because the warrant was invalid. It was supposed to only be served within uh, DC, but in fact, they tracked him in Maryland. It was supposed to have been served within 10 days. In fact, they turned it on 11 days later. So for the purposes of the case, the justices have to assume that there was no warrant. And the Obama administration is taking the very aggressive position that uh, we have no expectations of privacy in public, and therefore it's perfectly permissible for the government to track all citizens 24-7 without a warrant. Uh, there was a remarkable moment at the oral argument in the case where Chief Justice John Roberts asked the government's lawyer precisely that question. He said, is it the position of the government that uh, the police could put secret GPS devices on the bottom of the cars of the justices of this court and track us 24 seven? Mm -hmm. And when the lawyer said yes, I, I think and hope that he, he may have lost the, uh, the case. Uh, but the, the lower courts have divided on this question. Several courts have held, along with the Obama administration, that we have no expectation of privacy in public and therefore 24-7 tracking is permissible. And indeed, Tim Wu's uh, uh, former boss, Judge Posner, in a rather cursory opinion, embraced that position. Uh, however, some courts have disagreed, of course, in the 
neutral brooking spirit. I'm not going to tell you what I think about this case, but uh, let me just say. Did you already tell us? Well, but I think <laughs> for people who haven't seen it, I guess I did. Well, I'll just I'll just repeat. Tell me hope. He didn't say what his view on the merits. Uh, well, I, I, I just want to describe this this uh, as a visionary uh, opinion uh, on the other side. Uh, Judge Douglas Ginsburg here on the U.S. Court of Appeals in D.C. Uh, said there's a huge difference between short-term and long-term surveillance. It's one thing for the police to track someone for 100 miles using a beeper placed in a can of ether in his trunk, as the court said was permissible a few years ago. But by contrast, 24-7 surveillance can reveal so much more about us, our associates, our uh, movements, the magazines we read, and the uh, people we hang out with, that we do have an expectation of privacy in the whole of our movements. So my question to my colleagues is, you know, you're a justice on the court. Uh, which position do you take? The no expectation of privacy position, the difference between short-term and long-term uh, surveillance position, which says that there is an expectation of privacy against ubiquitous surveillance, or in the spirit of Goldilocks, somewhere in between. Uh, Justice Scalia at the oral argument was focused on the fact that putting the GPS device on the bottom of the car without permission was a trespass. So if the justices decided on those grounds, it would be consequential for this case, but wouldn't tell us more about the constitutionality of open planet and so forth. And in the course of your answers, not to be too uh, irritatingly law professor-ish, I, I do hope you'll uh, tell uh, our audience and, and, and each other, should we expect the courts to rule broadly to take the lead in protecting privacy in public? Or are there other bodies? Tim, in your paper, you say administrative agencies like the FCC are going to be more important than the court. Ben, you talk about voluntary cooperation between citizens and law enforcement being more important than unilateral action by judges. And Carter, you talk about lower court judges uh, pragmatically not jettisoning common law doctrines to protect uh, liberty. So Justice Wu, you're up uh, first. Justice what are you going to do in the GPS case? Uh, yeah, well, great, uh, great question. I have, well, I need to say something first of all, which um, uh, is that my, it's a little boring, but my opinions represent my own and not the uh, opinion of the federal government that I work, happen to work for right now. Um, Thank you for that. Yeah, I, I should have said it earlier, but oh well. It all <laughs> retroactively applies as well. Uh, I, I, a few observations. Uh, you know, I think um, it's been a while since I've uh, thought heavily. I'm not a Fourth Amendment scholar, but uh, the, the thing I do, um, I felt about the Fourth Amendment, and I continue to feel now, is that um, in a nutshell, it's too hard on cars. In other words, <laughs> <laughs> you know, people spend a lot of time in cars, and there's a lot of protection for the home, but, you know, for a lot of people, their, their car is kind of, some people can't afford a home, which is one thing. But other people, for other people, you know, a lot of people spend a lot of time in cars, and we are remarkably uh, lacking in constitutional protections for cars, uh, you know, for our for moving around. Um, I think that's a sort of a mistake, and you know, there's this strange thing in America when you're in your home, you have all kinds of protections, both constitutional and legal. You can you can sort of shoot people. You don't have to retreat. The police can't come in without extensive warrants. All kinds of things. As soon as you leave your house and get in your car, you become a, a you know an open target. You're almost like a citizen in, in in Yemen or something. I mean, you can't be hit by a drone, but it's close. You, you basically can be arrested for any offense. You can be uh, pulled over. You can be searched, and and, that, and the government wants to put uh, GPS things on you. So, uh, my opinion is uh, along more more generally feeling that cars should get more protection. Uh, you have more constitutional rights in your car. Uh, I I think that. Um, it should be a, considered a search or a seizure, or search, I guess, and uh, you have an expectation of privacy in your car. But I would be remiss without adding that the, that's not really the rele that is a relevant issue, but not the only relevant issue. Uh, again, I, as I suggest in my talk about free speech, the whole game is about intermediaries. Why do the police care about putting the GPS uh, thing on your car when they can pull off your iPhone? I mean, your iPhone is storing where you've been over the last year. Um, pull up that record, you, you don't need to put a GPS under someone. You don't have to find someone's car. You just call up uh, Verizon or AT&T or if, uh, t you know, if AT&T had bought T-Mobile, there'd be even fewer intermediaries. You just deal with one of them and say, well, where's this guy been over the last month? And the question is whether there's an expectation of privacy in that. So I think the intermediary question I is in some ways uh, almost more important. Uh, Excellent. Um, it's true about expectation of privacy in cars. Uh, the Texas Attorney General famously said that for many people, sex ed and driver's ed takes place in the same uh, place. <laughs> <laughs> but this uh, focus on intermediaries is crucial. And Judge Kaczynski, in his really remarkable uh, dissenting opinion on the Ninth Circuit, said, unless we act to do something right now, the police will be able, without any cause, to pull up our locational data from 
uh, AT&T and T-Mobile. He said, I grew up in Bucharest. I was the child of Holocaust uh, survivors. Uh, 1984 has arrived. So yeah. you're, you're right to call our time. Do you want, do you want to answer the yeah, intermediaries wanna, question? Well, what should the court uh, do in thinking? Assuming, I just want to point out that is the question. But I yeah. want to reiterate that point about, about car. There's this tendency in American constitutional law to be too extreme on either too dramatically extreme. I mean, like I said, we have almost too much protection in our own homes. It, 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 like I, I'm not saying we shouldn't, but you know, it's, it's armored to the hilt. You can do anything you want. You can, you can, you know, you're almost free from uh, any kind of uh, uh, surveillance whatsoever. But uh, you know, as soon as you get in a car, you have, you have fewer rights in, in the United States than you have in other countries. I always feel like whenever I'm driving in the United States, I, I'm always feeling like there's some chance of being arrested for some reason. And I, I think it's not... Uh, it's unworthy of a country that calls itself free, the lack of freedoms we have in our, in our cars. Um, uh, as for the intermediary question, I, uh, the question I pose is if you can get the same information off people's phones, then the GPS uh, information, uh, you know, strapping the GPS thing to the car is not quite as important. And similarly, I guess, uh, to be consistent, I feel that the, the, um, it is very important uh, that we have expectations of privacy and the information that the carriers uh, have, uh, the phone companies, and increasingly the internet intermediaries. And one of the things I just want to point out is that there's been a pattern of consolidation in all these industries, which has had an effect. Uh, you know, we've sort of thought of the internet as generally being a very open, very uh, atomized industry. But when you look around, there's not that many companies left these days. And so it's not only now just a question of the carriers, it's a question of the big three or four internet companies and the information they have. Uh, and this is why how it ends up connecting to, to issues of privacy, Facebook, Google, um, investigations, and related questions. So it all becomes of a piece, I, I'm suggesting. You know, if face, basically, if Facebook knows where you are, that, that's enough. If Foursquare knows where you are, and so on. That's great. And indeed, in uh, an essay by Oren Kerr in this volume, uh, Oren suggests that he agrees with you that there should be an expectation of privacy and data turned over to third parties, questioning what the courts have called the third party doctrine, which is if I make my locational information available to Verizon, I abandon all expectation that Verizon won't turn it over to the government. But Kerr's solution is use limitations. Rather than focusing on preventing Verizon from collecting the data, the, uh, a statute could say Verizon can't share the data with law enforcement, for example, unless there's evidence of a serious crime if they just find evidence of a low-level crime, like adultery, for example, uh, then they can't uh, share it without some higher cause. So that's a, a crucial yeah. question. Justice Sneed, uh, I want to ask what you think. And if you want to yeah. uh, fancy up the hypo by asking whether the cops could brain scan right. you in your car as well, then that would be right. uh, entertaining no, that's, for all that's, of us. That's, yeah, that would be entertaining, uh, although the magnet might pull the car uh, apart if that were <laughs> the, the fMRI were used. Um, the, um, the, uh, so th there are a couple interesting things about this GPS case. First of all, I, I agree with... Uh, Justice Wu that cars uh, have really gotten the short end of the stick in terms of expectation of privacy doctrine, although it's still true that, uh, and that's arguable, there's this sort of standing warrant exception to the, for the automobile because of its pervasive regulation and its capacity to move quickly and so forth. But uh, I think that there's an answer to this case in the extant jurisprudence of Fourth Amendment investigations that wouldn't require the justices to do anything radical and in the sort of spirit of moderation. I would say if you look at the, at the previous cases, which turn on unmediated sense perception and the use of technology to transcend that as being the kind of marker between where there is no expectation of privacy versus where there is an expectation of privacy might provide an answer. So the Caro case, which you referred to, where, which involved the placement of a beeper, which is kind of a more rudimentary tracking device uh, in, a, in a can of ether, uh, the court said that the, the monitoring of that device was permissible. There was no s expectation of privacy when you could visually identify where the car is and where it's moving by looking up. Now, you don't have to actually do that, but if you could do it, then that's a legitimate use of that technology. However, when you're monitoring the location of the canister inside the house and whether or not it's moves, and this, this is the house-car house, house car dichotomy that Justice Wu talked about, once it's inside the house, if you're doing something, if you're, if you're engaging in surveillance that would not be possible absent a physical trespass without the use of this technology, then that gets to the heart of what the Fourth Amendment originally was meant to protect. Justice Scalia makes this argument in the Kylo case involving thermal imaging of a house. You look at a house right. and catching the sort of heat coming off a house to draw inference about the presence of marijuana grow lights inside the house. Justice Scalia said, look, if you're using technology to do something that you couldn't have previously done without physically entering the home, 
you are functionally entering the home, and therefore that should be, t should be dealt with as, uh, as a search that does, in fact, implicate both the objective and subjective expectations of privacy that define what a search is. So I think we, and the court could say, we're going we're gonna to just extend Caro, and not only that, but Florida versus Riley, the case involving the helicopter going over semi-open enclosures involving growing marijuana. They say, if you can look out of your plane, if, if the technology is in widespread use, and you look out of your plane, air, air, helicopter, and you can see the marijuana growing, that's kind of like a plain view situation. There's no expectation of privacy. But if you're using something to amplify your sense perception, using technology to try to get at that information, now you've crossed over and this is a search. And it seems to me that we'd, you'd be well within the, 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 the structures that are already in place with respect to Fourth Amendment jurisprudence to say that the GPS monitoring, when you couldn't do so absent physical uh, you know, viewing, is itself a violation. And I, th I think that that might be one way to, to address the, the concern itself. Interesting. Now, where does that leave Open Planet? So in five years, let's imagine that it is in uh, general use for people to <laughs> sign on to Facebook and Google and track each other 24 or 7. This is the tricky question. So, and Justice Scalia in the, in the Kylo case itself mentions, the, the, so the two prongs are, is there unmediated sense perception and how widespread is the technology in use? Justice Scalia says, I'm not very uh, happy about this widespread use proposition because that makes the expectation of privacy grow and shrink depending on the applications and widespread possession of different kinds of technology, which is cert has a certain kind of logic to it because if we're talking about expectations, do I subjectively expect and is this the kind of expectation that one would, the man on the street would agree to as a reasonable expectation of privacy? There's a certain kind of logic to it, but I think Justice Scalia rightly, and he says the reason I'm including this is because the, the question has not been called as to whether or not we should jettison that part of the test. I think maybe we should think seriously about whether that should be jettisoned. I think the unmediated sense perception and, the, and, and whether or not you're achieving a, a, an end that would originally not have been possible without a physical trespass is, is a useful framework. And one further thing I would say is originally, back in the old days in the Katz case involving the, the listening uh, you know, outside of the, uh, outside of the, the telephone, in, in the, in, uh, the, and, and then later on in the garbage case and, uh, where they talk about, if you, if you're, if you, and you mentioned this earlier, talk about putting off brainwaves. If I sort of release my possessory interest in something, then the police are free to take it and, or a third party user is free to convey it to someone up to the cops if they want to without implicating my expectation of privacy. There was a very old debate about whether or not the object of expectation of privacy is simply a descriptive principle. That is, are people, do you just go with what society expects in a kind of descriptive way, or is there a normative component to it? That is, should we dis define the, ex the, the object of expectation of privacy by virtue of the kind of society that we want to live in, as opposed to the kind that we do live in? Of course, people go through your trash, but do we want to build into our jurisprudence that kind of you know, weakness in, in, in human conduct? So we may, might call for a revivific revivification of the normative dimension of the expectation of privacy argument. Justice Wittes, that's a very strong proposition. Uh, should judges be in the business of deciding how much privacy people should expect? If so, what would the principle look like? Or is that just too high-handed? And would it be better to leave it up to things like the geolocational privacy bill, which is now pending in Congress and sponsored uh, by uh, both Senator uh, Ron Wyden, an Oregon Democrat, but also Josh Chaffetz, the Utah Republican? Our legislature is better equipped than judges to decide how much privacy people should expect. Well, it's funny you mention that. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so I, I want to actually start um, by saying that I think the point that Tim raises, which is the intermediary question, um, is actually the critical point. Um, and it relates, as he alluded, very, very closely to the free speech issues that he was talking about earlier. Um, one of the things that, you know, be there is a very old principle in Fourth Amendment law that if you give data to a third party, um, that's outside of the ambit of, of protection. So if I, if I give you a bunch of records and the government subpoenas those records from you, that's it. They get it. Um, there may be limitations on, on the scope of the subpoena, but they're not, I don't have a Fourth Amendment interest in those third party records. Um, now, if you think about your cell phone, your cell phone is bleeping to a carrier a third-party record every, you know, few moments. Um, and those records identify your location with a fairly high degree of precision. And the, the later the phone, the model of the phone, and the more GPS-enabled, 
you know, the, the, the more specific the location data that it's recording about you over time. So to put this in real terms and in contemporary terms, I, we're not talking about the year 2025 or 2030. I have a Brookings colleague who heard about this project and who um, mused, oh yeah, I was just on a jury that got a bunch of geolocation data. And I said, really? Um, and he said, yeah, and I, I, I could be mangling the details of this, um, so, so, but, but the broad picture is right. He said, yeah, I was on a jury in, in, I'll keep the towns out of it, one town in Virginia, and the defendant denied adamantly that he'd um, murdered uh, somebody in a different town in Virginia. And the prosecution um, simply showed that at the relevant period of time, his cell phone got into a car, drove to within you know, 30, 40 feet of the house in which the murder took place, let him off, you know, got out at the, the, the spot of the murder, hung out there for a short period of time, overlapping with the time in the murder, got back in the car, and drove back to the first town. Um, now, none of this is even arguably under current doctrine a matter of about which the Fourth Amendment has very much to say. Um, and so the first question, you know, as, as Jeff points out, and, you know, is if the government attaches a GPS to your device to your car, um, you know, that's yesterday's technology, actually, when you get right down to it. T today's technology is that you've attached the GPS device to your body. Um, and all they have to do is call somebody up um, with a variety of instruments, legal instruments, that operate not on the basis of probable cause. Um, they operate on the basis of uh, relation, you know, being relevant to a lawfully constituted investigation, either a criminal investigation or a national security investigation, uh, or a, you know, a, some other type of investigation. I, you know, so. Th th that's today's technology. And so my first, my first point is that the problem is actually a, a little bit more acute than the GPS case in, in Jones suggests. Yeah. Um, but my second point is that all that notwithstanding, I disagree with the other members of this panel about what the proper outcome in the case is. I think, the, um, I think there is not an obviously, to my mind, judicially manageable standard um, to think about what, you know, how long do you have to surveil somebody's GPS data um, before it becomes a search when you could just follow them around 24-7 if you really cared about it. I think this stuff should be much more highly regulated than it is. Um, but I would like to see that evolution take place through a more legislative and less judicial process. And given the magnitude and pervasiveness of the third party doctrine, I don't think, even if you say in this case, um, this is a search, it still doesn't make the, set, the iPhone data a search. And it's much harder because of the third party doctrine to get there with that and I would just, I would much rather see Congress take a serious look at this and say, um, here's the degree of privacy that we think you're entitled to, both from government and from your carrier, by the way. I mean, you know, that I would much rather see that debate happen in the context of a deliberative legislative process over time. And so with all deference to the anxieties that lead people to want this to be judicialized, um, I actually don't. And I, I would return just briefly to um, Jeff's point about what seems to have animated the Chief Justice in this conversation, which was the sudden realization in oral argument, if in fact it was sudden in, in oral argument, and that, that can be deceptive, obviously. But, um, that this could apply to him, right? Um, and you know, Dahlia Lithwick, uh, the, the, the great uh, Slate Supreme Court commentator and uh, comedian, um, <laughs> d I, I mean, she really is brilliantly funny, um, once described an ACLU lawyer arguing in front of the Supreme <laughs> Court and saying, you know, this is a slippery slope. If it could happen to my client, it can happen to you, it can happen to all of us. And then she paused, she says, this doesn't seem to get a lot of traction with the justices. 
perhaps because justices of the United States Supreme Court so rarely deal crack out of their chambers. Um, and I, 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 I think this actually, the, the contrast between Dahlia's story, which is funny and deeply, deeply true, um, and what Jeff is describing with Chief Justice Roberts, where you know this belief that the police could simply slap something on you know, a justice's car and watch them forever. I, I, I think that anxiety, um, that difference, um, is probably not valid, valid as a matter of constitutional principle. But it is valid as a matter of, you know, can you muster the kind of political coalition that it should take to think seriously about what kind of regulation you want in this space. And so I would say, um, be patient, and um, and um, I dissent. Can I, Jeff, can I ask a quick question? Sure. I mean, I, I take the point about the intermediary institutions being the real ball game going forward. But what I want, I just I would ask my my colleagues: Do you think that it is worth continuing to consider the difference between state action and the action of third intermediaries? Because to my mind, that's a significant difference. The idea of, and maybe they'll never, there will be no need to do it in the future. But there seems to me a difference. And certainly in the current jurisprudence, there's a difference between the government putting something on your car versus asking a third party to provide information. You're, you're well, absolutely right. Yeah, please. Yeah. Well, what's the difference? I mean, I know there's well, a constitutional difference, but what's the difference to you? Yeah. Uh, probably getting it off the carrier is more effective, right? I mean, well, it seems to me like, like I, what's the interest in your privacy as a as a human being? What, what's the difference? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, so it's difficult to disentangle as opposed to a lawyer, I guess. Right. Right. So right, it's, it's, it's difficult to disentangle the kind of um, to, to get outside of the doctrine itself and criticize it, right? So I mean, you could you could say on a sort of a, a, I mean, to, to the to the individual. I mean, you think the case involved the sort of gross facts of the Greenwood case involving the garbage, right? So the question is, do you give your you give your garbage, put it out, give it to the garbage man, and then the garbage guy gives it to the cops, right? So it strikes me that, and the question is, is there a reasonable expectation of privacy once you've conveyed that property to the third party. It seems to me your possessory interest seems like a different dimension of the calculus, whether you still have a continuing interest in that information. And also you have the kind of the, the agency of the third party itself and its decision to keep or convey the information to the government. It seems, it seems to me that the, the, the more attenuated relationship seem, seems relevant uh, in, right. in that respect. I, mean, I think the theory is we're more afraid of the government because there's monopoly on force and, you know, and they have these people called police who put things on, on your machine. Well, in theory, if you don't like um, uh, your cell phone company or, or, your, or, or even Apple carrying information, right. supposedly you can move to somebody else. Uh, my question is, when you have increasing consolidation, how realistic is that model? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we can sort of switch, but it, it's, there's not a lot of variation in the oligopoly uh, between in privacy policy. So it has, to my mind, it... it the, the difference is supposed to be based on, on a market, the difference right. between the market and the state, but I... Well, but, the but, 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 but I think market. there's, another, the, 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 there's yeah. another force that pushes against the difference, and here I'm yeah. arguing against my, my proposed outcome, but I mean, the other difference is just the pervasiveness of the amount of data that we put in the hands of third parties, right? Yeah. And, you know, if, if you, if you're, if the third party doctrine is, I've entrusted a box of stuff to Jeff, Right, and the government issues a subpoena for Jeff to turn over that box of stuff. That's a very manageable privacy problem from my point of view, because I just have this decision to make. Do I trust Jeff to be the custodian of my stuff? Do I, what kind of records do I store in a bank vault? What sort of records do I keep in my own house where, as Tim points out, the Fourth Amendment is strongest? You know. Um, the more my data that I have no perception of having turned over to anybody is itself covered by the third party doctrine, the, the more pressure that puts on that sort of basic right. philosophical underpinning of it. Um, and I think it, it is ripe for, for a, a really hard conceptual look. I, I, just, I just don't really want that hard conceptual look to be done by the Supreme Court. But here's a question, though, and I don't know, this isn't my area of expertise, so I may be missing something obvious, but the government, even if the government wants to compel a third party to hand over information against its wishes, and, it's, and obviously certain third party intermediaries are going to want to have the reputation of telling the government no when it's, when it's, uh, when it's 
customers, you know, uh, privacy is at, is at stake. But put, put that to the side for a moment. The government still wants to compel that information. It still has to have probable cause and a warrant, right? In the same way that it would have, to have probable cause and a warrant to compel that information from you directly. No. The, que the question is, what is the data? If they're unwilling to do it, they can't, right? If they're unwilling to do it, they can't, they can't, they, they have, I mean, it, like the, I'm thinking with a Stanford versus, uh, Daily case, right, where, where the question was, do you have to have probable cause and a warrant to compel this newspaper to hand over the photos of the, uh, of the demonstration which implicated some third party who wasn't, whose interests weren't at stake? And the answer there was no, because it was held that we don't have expectation of privacy in the photos held by the newspaper. And when the court in the 1970s said that when I turn over information to the bank, the bank can turn it over to the government without any standard of cause. There was a rebellion because people disagreed. They didn't think that the bank was going to be turning over their financial information to the government. And Congress passed a law, the bank privacy law, that requires a higher standard, a warrant of probable cause. Let me, let me try to sum up this extremely illuminating discussion, which very much uh, mirrors the, the kind of debate you find in the book. So we have Justice Alito over here, actually, who uh, says that although he believes that the future uh, of this question will be determined by the choices of the technology companies, and in particular, simple questions like how long are they going to store the GPS data or the cell phone data? That, that technological question made by the intermediaries, he thinks, will have far more influence over the future of privacy than anything the Supreme Court does. Nevertheless, he thinks because this is a contested question, it should be left to Congress. He's optimistic about the existence of a bipartisan consensus, and, and, and he hopes that uh, Congress will act without the court uh, stepping in. Uh, Justice, uh, no, maybe not quite Justice Brennan, but maybe Justice Harlan thinks that judges do have a role in deciding how much privacy people should expect. And unless the Supreme Court in this case sets down a rule saying that when it comes to technologically enhanced surveillance that the naked eye could not do it without hiring a thousand police officers to track you 24-7 for a month, uh, it's important that that be uh, viewed as uh, illegal. And Justice, I don't know if you're Justice Breyer or I hope you'll be Justice Kagan because she's really increasingly <laughs> interested in these right. intermediary questions, really sees uh, this case as an interplay between these other two visions. On the one hand, protect privacy in cars. Uh, it's, it's wrong and doesn't coincide with our intuitions to not protect it to some degree. But you think it's really an interrelation between the judicial doctrine and the administrative doctrine will be crucial. And your challenge to, uh, to Brennan over here that uh, what in practice is the difference between the government doing it and the uh, intermediary doing it is at the core of your paper here too. I'm just going to uh, adopt the position of my hero, Justice uh, Louis Brandeis, who in many ways is the mm. patron saint of this entire project. Brandeis, in addition to writing the greatest uh, article on privacy ever written in 1890, also was impatient in the 1920s when the court evaluating wiretapping for the first time refused to protect as much privacy in the 20th century as citizens took for granted in the 18th. He said you used to have to break into someone's desk drawers to invade their privacy. Suddenly, by eavesdropping on telephone wires without breaking into the office of a suspected bootlegger, Brandeis said, you can invade the privacy of uh, people on both ends of the conversation. And then in this incredible passage, which looks forward to the age of cyberspace, Brandeis said, ways may someday be developed by which it's possible without invading the privacy of the home to extract secret papers from desk drawers and introduce them in court. A far lesser invasion was unreasonable at the time of the framing. We need to translate constitutional values into the 20th and 21st century. So uh, with Brandeis as my model, uh, I hope the court uh, recognizes the complexity of these issues and does uh, protect uh, us against ubiquitous surveillance, but also realizes that they will not have the last word on the subject and that intermediaries will be crucial as well. Ladies so, and gentlemen, we... Uh, so let's, uh, let's, let's go take some questions from the audience. Um, please uh, wait for the mic to come around and um, say who you are and what organization you represent. Please. Uh, hi, I'm Fred Altman. I'm just retired. And my question is, could you get around some of this problem by requiring all the people who gather this third-party data to have a way of allowing you to shut it off so that right. your cell phone does not, when you don't want to use it, doesn't right. necessarily provide location data? I mean, you could generalize that to other situations, and it might get around some of these problems. Yeah. That's, uh, that's a great question. And... Um, 
It's really a, a job for our agency. I, I work for Federal Trade Commission, and this is a this is what I'm trying to suggest. Is a lot of these issues are, are also questions of, of, of privacy, and I want to actually take up something uh, that, that Benjamin was talking about, which is he, he wants a legislative uh, solution, not a judicial solution, but there's actually another option, which is the, and, and I think what's actually happening is agencies are starting to yeah. sol solve these problems. And so um, the Europeans have this idea. Uh, it's not popular, not popular in America yet, but they have the idea that you should have the right to be forgotten, that uh, they want to require it, but maybe we could sort of encourage it in this country, which is to say, you know, an easy off, like sort of what you're suggesting. Uh, they, they want, uh, and I, I think this right's quite interesting, the idea that, you know, look, I'm Facebook, I'm done with it. Uh, you know, it was fun for a while, but it got embarrassing or something weird happened or my children or my teachers. So, so that's it. I'm, uh, I want to be off. And when I be off, I want to really be off and like not be kind of lingering around, but gone. Um, so why not a right to be forgotten button? And it's a little bit what you're talking. Maybe you should have more uh, it would be great to have more privacy by design is another big phrase uh, in this area, the, the, the right to switch off when data is being collected from you. And I think that would, um, that would be a, an important a development. How does it happen? Well, the companies have to do it. Uh, they don't want to do it because of, uh, it, it, the, the model, the reason not to do it is advertising. Mm -hmm. So I want to add to this that it's the, yeah. the business model of most of these companies is based on advertising. And so the reason they want to collect the data is for advertising purposes. So there's a weird confluence, and I think nobody deeply understands these factors completely, between <laughs> privacy, advertising interests, the fact that consumers don't want to pay for things, and then search and seizure law, all kind of bundled yeah, together yeah. in a way that's very difficult to understand. And I think fundamentally goes to this central question of intermediaries and third parties. And I guess I'll say there are third parties and there are third parties. There's me, you know, leaving like you said, a box of documents with my friend, and, uh, and then him turning over to the police or leaving on the side of the street. And then there's you know, monopolies or near monopolies who everyone feels they have to be a member of to communicate or be a member of society. And there have always been some intermediaries which are just a little different. You know, it's very difficult to function today without using the internet. Uh, you can try, you, can be, you have a choice now. Uh, this is something, among, believe it or not, the Unabomber said, which is you can only have two choices. You have to be completely connected today and surrender almost all your privacy, or you have to live in a little hut. And we've gotten to the point where you don't have sort of an intermediate choice. You have to be kind of completely unplugged. Google Earth can still see your hut. Well, so <laughs> exactly. Google, Google Earth, Earth can still see your hut. That, that, that's, why he moved, that's why he moved to the hut. Um, <laughs> that's why he ultimately moved to the hut. Because he really uh, concluded it wasn't, you know, there was no like one way in. And that's, there's, that's a sort of a problem. I think it's what you're alluding to. A lot of people want it to be part way. They don't want to be fully exposed, but it's very difficult to be a member of society. Well, if I, that, just, a, that, just a word on the, right, just on the right to forgotten, yeah. to, be, to yeah. be forgotten, if I may. Uh, and, and, and the, of course, the Unabomber's effort to be forgotten were especially thwarted. The hut is now in the museum. I, I saw it last the weekend with my, my, with my kids there. <laughs> <laughs> the problem with the right to be <laughs> forgotten, it makes sense uh -huh. uh, if it limits collections. So uh, Verizon and iPhones can't uh, collect my locational data or have to destroy it. But when it regulates use, it really clashed with free speech. So there was a fascinating mm. case in Argentina recently where a pop star who would posed for racy pictures of herself, which got out on the internet, became embarrassed and wanted to take them down. And she sued Google and Yahoo. And an Argentinian judge agreed that these pictures violated her dignitary right, her right to be forgotten, and ordered Google and Yahoo to take them down. They said, we can't. The judge said, yes, you can. We're going to fine you $50,000 a week. Yahoo said, okay, but it's too hard just to remove the racy pictures. We're going to remove all pictures of this woman and all references to her on the Yahoo search engine. So now if you plug in her name, you get nothing. So that's a real selective mm -hmm. deletion of history, which I think the American First Amer Amer Amendment tradition doesn't count. In. The, the uh, details of how this right are to be enforced are also fuzzy. I debated the French privacy commissioner who proposed this right, the droit à l'oubli, the right to oblivion, which, by the way, is straight out of Sartre. It's Honestly. completely French. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and I said, how are you going to enforce it? And he said, well, we'll create, uh, I don't know, an international commission of forgetfulness. <laughs> we'll sort of that decide bad. on a case-by-case -case basis what comes up or what comes down. <laughs> so how it's going to be enforced is tough, but 
the, uh, Tim's uh, comments suggest we're about to see a titanic battle in norms between Europe and America with the Europeans trying to enforce this right, the Americans resisting it, how this plays out technologically and in the courts uh, I, I also dazzles think the mind. Just be before we get to Charlie Dunlap, I just wanted to follow up on one other thing that, that Tim said, which was you know, this idea that um, you know, people want to be part way in and, right. and have, you know, they don't want to be off the grid, but they also don't want the costs of pervasive uh, surveillance. And, and, you know, I am entirely sympathetic to that. But part of me also wonders whether for a lot of those people, they're asking for the benefits of a transaction without the costs of it. Mm -hmm. and, and that, you know, when you ask for all the convenience associated with littering the world with your data, and to be relieved of all of the costs and risks associated with that, there may be something unreasonable in the consumer demand in, the, in, in its very essence there. And it may be that part of the answer is that we shouldn't be acquiring the degree of individual dependency that we all are on things that require us to give away sensitive data about ourselves. Right. Charlie? Just to follow up, uh, Charlie Dunlap from Duke uh, Law School Superb panel, could not be more important subject, and I'm very anxious to read the book. Uh, two questions. One, a permutation on, on the discussion so far. What about the rise of masking technologies? I think that there are going to be technologies, and unlike a speeding detector, it isn't per se trying to mask illegal behavior, but just ensure privacy. What's, how do you think government's going to react? And then another thing, I sort of see anecdotally among uh, students and younger people, they seem less concerned about privacy than uh, maybe somebody of my generation. And do you think in the future that the whole notion of privacy and the value of privacy, the norm will change? And because they don't, they sort of think the government's looking at whatever is on the web, and they seem relatively untroubled with it. I'm generalizing and speaking anecdotally, but I'd be interested in your views. On, on the second uh, question, because I do write about this a bit in the chapter, uh, no, I don't agree with those who say privacy is over, uh, get over it. It's true, polls suggest that young people are less concerned about some aspects of privacy uh, than older people. For example, they're less upset about being naked at airports, because uh, they uh, look much better than the rest of us. Uh, <laughs> however, when it comes to Facebook, they're really concerned. And when they're applying for jobs, they're getting smart about selectively deleting bits of their past, and they feel angered and invaded when they're fired or not hired because of Facebook pictures taken out of context. And their expectations change as they get older, obviously, too. So there's a lot of granular research on this. Dana Boyd at Microsoft is doing it. But it's just too simple to say the problem is going to go away because in the future we'll all live in glass yeah. houses. On, on, on masking technologies, there are interesting uh, possibilities. There's a SUS valence movement that is suggesting that people literally wear masks in public uh, in Europe. More granularly, you can petition Street View right now if uh, there were some uh, college students who were photographed sunbathing in California and they wanted to remove their images. And Facebook will remove individual uh, still shots, but that's obviously not an effective solution to the whole problem. I wonder, you, you, you wonder about the future of this masking technology. Imagine how European anti-veiling laws might be uh, mm -hmm. challenged in light of these new uh, efforts to conceal yourself. You're not allowed to cover your face in public in Europe uh, because of the uh, French uh, concern about uh, 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 religious uh, supremacism, but uh, that, that, that would ch uh, clash with this uh, pri privacy implication. Broadly, it's true that for every new technology, there's a response, so you can scrub your hard drives and uh, act like a privacy paranoid and browse anonymously and so forth. It'll be harder as the surveillance goes mobile and as the option not to have a mobile device would be like the Unabomber going out into the uh, woods. So it's, it's, it's promising and there, uh, it'll go back and forth, but, but ultimately I, I think it's not going to solve the problem and we're going to have to return to the choices of intermediaries uh, about collecting yeah. the data to, be, to begin with. I mean, it does, and the thing you didn't mention of the mobile is the move of most things to being cloud applications, which mm. once again turns everything into an intermediary question, which is kind of the, you know, if there are masking technologies, um, if they're all one company, I, it, it goes back to all these sort of Teddy Roosevelt questions. If, so let's say the masking tech, let's say everybody's relying as almost, okay, who in this room doesn't use Google, let's just say. Okay, so there we are. Oh, there's one. <laughs> okay, so, you know what I mean? so then a lot of the question, I mean, use Google Docs, Gmail, so forth. 
the masking technologies all turn into a question of what is Google doing? And then the question becomes, well, what are the advertising interests involved? What can the government compel Google to do? It's the same intermediate question that we keep going back to. Um, I want to, I don't know if this is a juncture, but I want to try taking this deeper to say what we're really talking about here. Because I think we're talking about something interesting, but we're talking about something different than we realize. And I want to try and make it a 2030 thing. Please. Which is to say that in some ways, even though it seems like science fiction and hypothetical, we're at the very beginnings of sort of understanding, and I hesitate to use this word, but I'll say it anyway, cyborg law. That is to say, the law of augmented humans. And the reason I say that is that, you know, in all these science fiction stories, there's always this sort of thing that bolts into somebody's heads, or you become half robot, or you have a really strong arm that can throw boulders or something. But um, what is the difference between that and having a phone with you, uh, sorry, a computer with you all the time that is tracking where you are, which you're using for uh, storing all of your personal information, your memories, your friends, your communications, that knows where you are and does all kinds of powerful things and speaks different languages. I mean, with our phones, we are actually technologically enhanced creatures. And that, those technological enhancements, we, which we have basically attached to our bodies, um, also make us vulnerable to more government supervision, privacy, invasions, and so on and so forth. And so what we're doing now are, are taking the very first, very confusing steps in what is actually a law of cyborgs as opposed to human law, which is what we've been used to. And what we're confused about is that this cyborg thing, you know, the part of us that's not human, not organic, has no rights. Right. But we as human have rights, and, but the divide is becoming very small. I mean, it's, it's on your body at all times. So I think this point is, is, yeah. is very profound. It, 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 it interacts with some, some work that I've been doing uh, related to robotics. And you know, there are now, there's now a drone that, that you can buy for your iPhone. And so this gives like very tangible expression to what Tim is talking about. You can go, you can look it up on iPhoneDrone.com, and you'll find that you know it's a little, it's a toy, but um, you can take basically a robot and control it. You know, flies around and you know sends missiles at your friends and things, um, at your friends' drones. That is um, from your uh, iPhone, and that of course raises the question. Uh, if you can do it with a toy, you can do it with a real thing, right? I mean, I, you know, I'm not suggesting that we're all going to have predators on our drones, but that sort of uh, on our iPhones. But that sort of expansion of one's individual capability is a very kinetic expression of what Tim is describing, and and I think it is clearly right that over time we're we're developing law about and and norms about what you have, where your rights extend to the technology that expands your individual capability in some sense. Other questions? We have one, oh, Stefan? Yeah, Stefan. And, then, and then the gentleman in the front. So just to make it a little bit more um, balanced to a certain extent, um, because obviously I mean, privacy is crucial, and I think it's a secondary use problem as well, because anyway, that's, anyway, how hard it is to actually deal with the, uh, um, the collection as well. Uh, but to make it a little bit more balanced and also complicated uh, is the whole question of big data um, um, to anyway add to the debate, which is that, guess what? We have now huge volumes of data. And guess what? As a result, we can actually produce new insights by having this data and having statistical uh, analytics um, provide inferences, anyway, uh, all kinds of predictions and all kinds of new insights that are relevant for science, for public policy, uh, policy drivers, and so on. And in order to do so, you need to have the data made available. I, so I mean, locking it in and, and closing it down actually undermines the whole concept of big data. So how will you factor that in, that narrative, especially when you have, anyway, like, for instance, in Europe, uh, yesterday there was an announcement, let's turn government data into gold. They, anyway, they initially said euros, but they changed that. And so, uh, <laughs> so, so um, how will they move into those kinds of um, value statements 
if privacy is being seen as actually the barrier. And so that will become a complicated debate, and I just want to add that. No, to this the, is uh, to a the very, debate. very important point. So Google, a couple of years ago, a few years ago, did an incredible project, um, uh, which they used flu as the, as the um, sort of template. But I think the, the broad point of it is probably extendable to a lot of other areas of life. And what they did is they took CDC data related to flu incidents, initially, I think, in certain parts of the United States, but then basically around the world. And they looked at the question of when people start experiencing flu symptoms, what Google terms do they search? And then they took so it turns out that this basket of terms, about 50 terms that involve things like headache, runny nose, you know, sort of symptomy kind of terms, spike about a week or two before flu starts showing up visibly in CDC data. And so what they did is they started tracking those terms. And what you would see was that, the, I mean, the curves run like this. They're, you know, Google is sort of two weeks ahead of the CDC on both the upticks and downticks. And it resulted in this incredible paper written by a group of Google people and a group of CDC people that basically says, oh, you can use Google and not anonymize query, you know, search data to, um, uh, to sh point out the spots that you're going to have flu problems in in the next couple weeks. Now, a group of people at Google went a bit further than this in, in certain other areas and wrote this also just amazing paper called Predicting the Present, which was an effort to describe, again, using very, very large N data sets. So the, the, like, it's everybody's search data, right? Um, basically looking at economic trends. And what they show is that, you know, you can actually do that. You can see all kinds of of incredible things in this awesome collection of data, which essentially amounts to a body of data about what all of us are thinking about at any given moment. Because the first thing we do is we go search. And this has incredibly powerful positive applications, as well as all of the anxieties it may produce about um, you know, privacy and other things. Um, and I think one of the things we're going to have to talk about as a society is whether we, what role we want aggregated and individualized and non-individualized data to be playing. And there's some, there is some sense in which, as Stefan says, you're going to take the good with the bad or take the bad with the good. I, I have a, a question. And again, like I said, this is not something that I think about as part of my research. But... One thing that worries me as we talk about this is, and, and using things as proxies, search terms as proxies for incidents of, of, uh, of flu, or at least concern about flu, right? You could imagine people, this, the, the, what it would show is where people are more neurotic about flu. As well, opposed, but, 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 but it correlates that. incredibly <laughs> precisely no, 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 with, no. That, with, with well, incidents. The, the deeper thing that worries me, and this in, picks up on what Tim's comment was earlier, is that I, I, I don't know if this is true, but my intuition is that there are large segments of the American and global population that are not using these technologies because of poverty or because of, you know, I, I keep thinking of the book Things White People Like, you know, and it's sort of listing among them, you know, Google Plus, all the, th and, and worries that insofar as we take these as proxies for uh, socially useful or, or matters of social concern, that there are going to be, at the very least, big lags in, in, in the sort of impoverished and, and, and less technologically savvy community. I'm thinking about Appalachia or the inner city. And, and would that push in favor of, and this connects with what Tim was saying, a kind of right to technology so that you can be part of the, of the community itself? That is, if I don't live in a, in a part of the world where I have an, a, a mobile phone or a computer or access to the internet, I'm effectively disenfranchised from the, the community of human concern. And should that be remedied? Or, or, or This seems like a serious problem. There was an interesting op-ed uh, in the Times recently by Susan Crawford suggesting a digital divide when it comes to technology use. And she said one solution is spectrum policy. So mm -hmm. back to Tim's point, the Federal Communications Commission is trying to uh, repurpose uh, spectrum uh, in order to extend its uh, uses into underserved areas. And that would be one uh, solution. But the broad big data problem <laughs> that don't keep your fingers crossed because yeah. of financial opposition um, based on uh, the lobbying, which again suggests that uh, those considerations rather than courts may determine the question. Ben suggests good uses, broad uh, looking at economic uh, data and flu. 
to predict the future. But Google doesn't just want to predict flu's and economic future to be altruistic. It wants to predict what I will think next. So that's what Eric Schmidt said at a conference in 2006. Our real goal is to tell you what you should be doing before you even know it, or to be able to answer <laughs> questions like, where should I go to college? And the reason Google wants to answer those questions is not just because it's cool, because they want to sell ads to me, not mm -hmm. only uh, online, but on my mobile device and increasingly in real spaces and tailor and target the ads based on what I've done in the past and what it thinks I'll do in the future. This obviously raises uh, privacy concerns because when the government knows what I'm going to be doing next before I do, uh, there are uh, consequences that follow. One, one solution to this, St Stefan, I think is, is Oren Kerr's notion. The, 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 the Germans have, uh, have, have grasped this. They give the government broad access to big data for prosecuting serious crimes, but when the uh, intelligence services are not allowed to share that information with the police when it comes to low-level crimes because of a concern about misuse. There's one other model that's worth noting. In his fascinating epilogue to this book, Larry Lessig of Harvard says, uh, the next problem is going to be um, the next attack. So when the next attack comes, all of our carefully constructed technological and uh, legal protections for privacy will go out the window because the government will say we need to track everyone 24-7. In order to avoid that, Chernobyl Lessig said, we have to basically tie ourselves uh, to the mast uh, uh, in times of calm and build into the internet an identity layer so that, yes, when uh, the government presents cause that someone is a suspected terrorist, then they can unmask them using this identity layer, but without the proper cause, they can't. That uh, mirrors uh, a decision that uh, some uh, uh, intermediaries like the company Palantir have made. They will engage in very granular data mining when they have individualized suspicion of wrongdoing, but they won't engage in predictive data mining because they're concerned about the consequences. On the other hand, Lessig's solution shows great faith in the ability of legal process to ensure that the system is used only for serious crimes and not low-level crimes. If you're less optimistic about that, you might not want to build in the mm -hmm. identity layer. Gentleman in the front has a question. We have time for a couple more questions. So if, if uh, flag me if you. If, if My you name is Brad Patterson. I served 14 years on the White House staff and 12 years at Brookings. And the subject of our panel is the Constitution and technology. And I have a question from the language of the Constitution. The issue is presidential disability. We're in two, 2030. And one and the vice president and a majority of the cabinet have just declared in writing that the president can no longer discharge the powers and duties of his office. And the president, in writing, has informed the Congress, no, I can discharge the powers and duties of my office. The issue then goes to the Congress, and within 21 days, they have to decide whether the president can discharge the powers and duties of his office. And it's 2030, and what the panel knows or can guess about the technology, medical, and what may, may, may well be questions of mental illness, where are we, what kind of technology can the Congress consider to help answer the question? They have 21 days to answer it. It's a great question. So, of course, by then the president will be, as Tim describes, a cyborg. And, and, and so, <laughs> so just look I, at his Facebook page. I would, see I, I would think the thing to do would simply be to remove the relevant <laughs> item, send it back to Apple, and they'll <laughs> fix it. Um, no, I, I actually, so in all seriousness, I, I actually think that that's just listening to you read that and describe that provision. I actually think that's one of the provisions that I wouldn't intuitively say is going to have a great deal of technological stress. Um, I, I could be wrong about that, I, you know. But but it's it's the jobs of the, the the demands of the presidency are extraordinarily taxing, and I I doubt very much that we're going to come to a point where you know somebody can be kept functional for purposes of the president within the judgment of of. The, the, the Congress of the United States through some technological means. Um, and if we do, I, I actually do have faith that the, the political um, structures will accommodate that reality in one way or another. Um, could be wrong about that, but I'm not so worried about presidential succession as a, 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 and incapacitation as a area that's profoundly different today than it will be 30 years from now. My, my colleagues may disagree with me. 
on the other hand, if, Car if Carter is right uh, and everyone is brain scanned, we may have a vision of a normal brain and the president might be brain scanned and we find that he has an overactive amygdala leading to low impulse uh, control because his prefrontal cortex isn't restraining his emotions well enough and uh, based on his failure to meet the standard, he could be viewed as disabled in the same way that uh, cr uh, criminal uh, that that uh, potential wrongdoers could be locked up indefinitely because of their predisposition. Wait, if you, oh, had, if you uh, took scans of everybody in Congress's brain, I think we might have to have a lot, a lot of more disability. Oh, yeah. <laughs> be a lot of sociopathy identified. No, but, 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 but I mean, I, I, on, 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 a, on a, I mean, an entirely Sorry, serious but, note. I mean, <laughs> as as those um, technologies get better and better at predicting aspects of behavior. I could see them playing a conceivable role in campaigns. Yeah, you could right? imagine I Mitt mean, Romney saying, look at my brain, it's so much more controlled than Newt Gingrich's brain. <laughs> His amygdala is so active. Brain is scan, is <laughs> <laughs> it helps. Pretty pictures. Are we incredible. have time for one more question. If Yes, the gentleman. Hi, my name is Fabri Di Piazza. Um, I'm wondering the extent to which it's maybe an anthropological question. Are these, do you think technology is posing fundamentally historically new problems to which we require categorically new answers? Or do you think that it seems like all of you to some extent have some faith in the existing jurisprudence and the existing institutions of the Constitution to resolve these issues? It, it's the ultimate question of the yeah. book, of course, and, and it's, it's a very fitting one on which to end. So I think if I, if I can, I'll just start briefly and then have right. each of my, my co-panelists um, give their thoughts and then we'll close. I, I, so I, I think there, are, there has always been a, a responsiveness on the part of the governance structure that the Constitution creates to new technologies. Um, we've had to address them before, either within the Constitution itself or um, you know, through its governance processes. So the, the, mo the, the most famous one in the Constitution itself is the Second Amendment, right? Where you know, cheap, available gunsmithing allowed in the late 18th century firearms to be in the hands of you know, every non-impoverished person who wanted one. And the response of the founders to that was so enthusiastic that they saw it, whatever one thinks of the original understanding of the Second Amendment, they saw it as, in some version, something that warranted affirmative constitutional protection. The Constitution has the, you know, the patent and uh, clauses, you know, that, that, that are essentially about cultivating the development of technology, right? Um, and, and, and ideas. Um, on the other hand, you know, think about the, the mid-20th century when we develop nuclear technology and the government's response to that is not to write a constitutional amendment that says, yippee, we've got nuclear technology, everyone's got a right to it. It's, in fact, the, just to say that is to giggle a little bit. It was to make sure that everybody who knew anything about the subject worked for the government, was responsible for keeping secrets, and we actually managed to keep incredible nuclear secrets for very, very long periods of time. Um, and so the responses, the responses differ really quite radically depending on cultural environment, the technology in question. Um, one thing that has tended to happen in my view is that the, the, we, it always feels like the challenge that a new technology poses is more radical than it later turns out to be. And um, this book has that risk. Um, my chapter may be the most at risk of that, although um, I, I look at the environment and the life sciences and security and I find it alarming. And I don't know how we adapt to it. But the fact that I don't know how we adapt to it doesn't mean that we don't adapt to it. It doesn't, you know, the, the limits of my imagination are, you know, undoubtedly a, a rounding error on, on the scope of human capacity. And, and so, you know, all you can do is, I, I have a certain anxiety. Um, I also have a lot of faith, to answer your question, and I, I do think that we're pretty good at adapting the Constitution over time 
um, through a variety of means, um, and I hope and expect we will continue to be so. Sorry. It's, yeah, I think you're right to, and Tim had raised this earlier about this is what we're really talking about is moral anthropology and like what we are and who we are and, and these are, and, and, and I think that and, and at some point what we do and what we can do merges with who we are and I think that was in some ways behind what Tim was saying, but the, and I'll confine my remarks to the cognitive neuroscience. I'm not sure, well there are two points here. First is if it's true, and it's a big if, and I'm actually not confident that it is true, if it's true that the, of what the proponents of the cognitive neuroscience project say about us, not just what we can do, but who we are, that is, we don't have free will. Now, it's a very ancient question, free will versus autonomy, you know, autonomy versus determinism and so on. But, but if, what's new about that, it strikes me, and going to the core of who we are, not so much what we can do in, in, the, in, the, in a first order question, if it's true, then I think that radically alters not just um, the, the law, but every aspect of, of, of human life. And, and it, it, it does represent a radical challenge to our moral anthropology and as it animates everything that we do. But I will say, and this is, this is I mean, so that's a big radical claim, but then the sort of side constraint on that is I actually don't think, I think that the claims that are being made by the cognitive neuroscientists who are promoting and their, and their sympathetic lawyers, social scientists, and philosophers who are with them, are in fact not demonstrations of the fact that we don't have free will, but rather extensions of axioms in modern science about uh, materialism and the process of reduction. That, uh, that, so it's more of a postulate than a proof. And I think that that, that uh, and until there is a proof, and I don't think there will be, and I don't think there can be, then our moral anthropology will remain roughly what it is. All right, well, I'll take the bait. And uh, I think, yes, and if you're in my essay, I think there is a pretty serious problem with the Constitution. Um, and, uh, and its current uh, approach to things uh, that um, it's not so much of a technological problem, but technology is making it more obvious. Uh, the Constitution, I think, basic idea of Constitution is that uh, concentrated power is a very dangerous thing. Um, uh, but the kind of original template, based on the experience of, uh, of Britain, was the idea that the only really serious concentrated power is that of the uh, state that the thing we had to worry about was King George and uh, basically we had relatively weak individuals and an all-powerful government and you needed protect the individuals need some protection against that all-powerful government and in order to prevent the same thing being replicated so we have Bill of Rights and it, in order to replicate to, to kind of avoid the problems of, a, of an all-powerful centralized government we created separation of powers and federalism so we divided power in, in, in various ways and that's the scheme and that, that's what we're all talking about but I think since that time, uh, the problem is a lot of the power in American society has uh, become uh, privatized. A lot of the most uh, 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 dangerous, I think, sources of concentrated power in private hands. And the Constitution really is, uh, doesn't have a lot to say about that, and it's uh, been a bit of a weak spot. I think almost all of our conversations come back to the thing, yes, but what it's all about what a powerful intermediary is going to do. And... Um, Right now, and it's been the American tradition to more or less depend on the ethics of uh, private institutions that, that take care of us, which is okay, but um, I think the American approach towards uh, wariness towards centralized power uh, maybe needs to be extended uh, further. Uh, I say that also because uh, the concentrations of private power can infect the constitutional system, and this is the problem of... Um, you know, the influence of, of money in Congress, is that uh, in some ways the, that level of concentration of power affects the rest of the constitutional design. So yes, I think there, there's a problem. And the fact that almost every question came back to the central question is, well, it all depends what the good graces of a private intermediary thinks shows that we have a problem with liberties in this country. I'd like to echo uh, Tim's uh, comments because they very much coincide to the spirit of the patron saint of Constitution 3.0, uh, Louis Brandeis. In addition to being the greatest theorist of trans the need to translate privacy in light of new technologies, Brandeis was also the greatest thinker in the 20th century who warned of the dangers of concentrated power. He talked about the risks that greedy banks take with other people's money. Yeah. He talked about the curse of bigness and the need to break up the banks so that they couldn't take these risks in a way that would cause financial depression. He was the patron saint of laws like uh, Glass-Steagall, which separated commercial and investment banking, which maintained financial stability until it was dismantled in the 1990s. And uh, in each of the questions that we've been discussing, I ask uh, the simple uh, question, uh, WWBD, what, what would Brandeis do? 
And I, and I think I could well imagine him in, in taking of any of the questions we talked about, recognizing the complex interplay of judicial doctrine, of, of regulation, and of technological choices by private intermediaries. And he could sketch out a solution that would, in fact, preserve constitutional values in the way that the, uh, would vindicate ben, Ben's optimism. The problem is that there may not be a political constituency for the sort of trust bu busting and regulation of private power that Brandeis recognized was necessary. Uh, despite the, uh, the flourishing of the Occupy Wall Street uh, movement and the new uh, uh, We Are the 99% slogan, Americans, at least in their legislation, have traditionally been reluctant to regulate the private sector and more willing to regulate the state. Europe is the opposite, which is why there are much more comprehensive European privacy laws and less restrictions on European state uh, information gathering. But I fear that we may be facing a situation where uh, there is a complicated solution to all of these problems, m m much of it involving regulation of the intermediaries, but the lack of political will actually to adopt it. But I have to close uh, by uh, ending on a spirit of optimism uh, in spite of uh, my doubts, and I, I just want to uh, remember Brandeis's uh, galvanizing uh, injunction, if we, must, uh, if we will guide by the light of reason, we must let our minds be bold. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, for a great discussion. Thank you.